Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 92 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Wally Balls. And I'm joined here by my affluent co-host, former market maker, 20 years and current day retail trader, the man who brought to you deals such as glue for human bones made out of sea coral and sponges with the soap already in them. You'll be seeing dollar, dollar spot signs if you stare at him too long. The Gorilla of House Street, JJ. Brother, what's going on? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Very good. Our guest today has been a full-time trader since 2012. A man who's abstracted millions in profit from the market as a retail trader, aka Koi Runner 89, Tim Gratani. Tim, how's it going, man? Hey, it's going well. Uh, thank you for having me on, you guys. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. Pleasure to have you on. Um, Tim, you know, I, I, we were talking a little bit beforehand. I, th I thought you were in Puerto Rico um, beforehand. I guess you made the move back to Ohio. Um, I have an affinity for Puerto Rico for various amount of reasons. How's your time down there? Um, yeah, I mean, I I had a blast down there, especially at first. You know, unfortunately, we moved down about nine months before Hurricane Maria hit. So, you know, that first nine months, like, no complaints. It was amazing. And then, um, you know, we had a condo that got all jacked up in a hurricane. And uh, just between, you know, the difficulties the island was facing and a little bit of island time mixed in there, uh, we weren't back in our place for well over a year, almost two years. And uh, then when we got back down there, it was just in time for COVID to hit. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, we wanted to get back and get a little closer to family, but I definitely miss it down there. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, awesome. For, um, for listeners that may be going to Puerto Rico or even for myself, who I, I plan on going here shortly, what, what were maybe some of your favorite activities? In Puerto Rico? Um, you know, the, the rainforest really surprised me. Like, I, I did not think that I would like the rainforest too much. I was thinking it'd be like a hot, muggy, buggy environment. Mm -hmm. And it was like cool, breezy, shady, waterfalls everywhere. Like, it was like natural rock water slides. So, getting into the rainforest was probably like one of our favorite things to do. Nice, man. Nice. Very good. Uh, reminder to the listeners if you guys would like to join JJ, myself, and a professional community of traders, you can join us at micro efutures.com. Tim, I know a lot of people are familiar with you. You, you do have a very good story, but I, I think it's the most logical start for us to, to start at the beginnings uh, for you. And, you know, just, you know, how'd you find your way into trading? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I was at Marquette University in college and I was a finance major. I had transferred halfway through. So I was already going a semester long to get all my graduation credits. And I was like nearing the end and I was like, man, I don't like a lot about finance. Like a, a lot of the career paths that seemed like they were pushing you towards was like accounting or like long-term investment planning and just none of that stuff really appealed. So I kind of broke into day trading just on my own because I was thinking like that seemed like the most exciting, you know, finance angle I could find. And the idea was like, let's just trade a bit and get a little experience, maybe sound competent in some job interviews down the road. And it really just kind of bloomed into this thing where, um, you know, well, I, I blow up my first $1,500. I had worked a summer at State Farm so I could refund. And I, uh, you know, I just, as I kept going and finally got my feet under me, I think I was only up two or $3,000 when it started to sort of click to me like, hey, you know what, like, I think I could do this full time. And that was about a month before graduation. So then I graduate in the winter, move back home, start trading full time 2012, had a deal with my parents where it was like, you know, prove that you can make money at this, make 10 grand in the first three months of the year. You know, that's on pace for 40K a year, which is, you know, yeah, basically about as good as you can expect getting out of college, I guess, like at least on the low end. Sure. And uh, yeah, I, I made that goal by mid February and uh, never really looked back. And uh, now it's, gosh, I don't know, something like 14, 15 million dollars later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. It, it, it's funny you say that because I, I remember when um, I, I first was like pursuing poker and it's like, I, you know, I wasn't really making that much at first, but it was like probably about on par with any type of job I could get. So I was like, man, there's no point, you know, let me just grind this out and, you know, go up from there. Uh, mm -hmm. Tim, what, what was, um, what did you gravitate towards? I guess like, you know, um, strategy wise, um, style wise, when you first, um, you know, attempted day trading? Uh, it was definitely like the manipulated pump and dump type stuff. 
Mm -hmm. um, both both long and short. I, I was trying everything in that space when I first started, just because I, you know, the, the idea of the manipulation was really new to me. I, I didn't really, I had never been introduced to the idea that like, oh, there might be somebody pulling the strings, you know, behind the curtain and uh, engineering how these things move. <laughs> so it really kind of turned into a game of uh, figure out what the big money is doing. And if you get long, realize that you're basically holding a hand grenade and you got to get rid of it quick. Um, so I, I was I was trying a lot of stuff. Um, I, I really thought short selling would be like super easy and uh, a layup, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I quickly found out, like I basically bled out my first fifteen hundred dollars trying to short sell. That's where I lost most of my money because I was just way too fearful. It was like I'd short sell, looking for that big fifty percent quick collapse, and if it didn't happen in five minutes, I'd be like, oh my gosh, they're still supporting it, and I'd cover for like a two cent a share loss and just do it like over and over and over again. Um, so once, once I finally calmed down a little bit and got a little more familiar with the space, I really found that the things that were working best for me at the time was going long them and going long them at times of, you know, maybe like afternoon breakouts or multi-day breakouts on the daily chart. Uh, the big one was back then new stock promotions by these guys like Austin Penny Stocks and uh, <laughs> Best Damn Penny Stocks. You know, these guys, they, they put out a pick and blast out the email to everybody. And the stock would be up 50%, 100% in five minutes. So it was really like that was that was really the big thing that took a lot of my attention in those first few months of going full time was how do I get those emails first? Because I want to be the fastest. I want to be at the broker where I can route to the right routes, get my fills. And uh, those were those were absolutely some of my biggest wins early on. I, I still remember my first big win was uh, a pump and dump AMWI where I basically threw $3,000 in and six minutes later, it profited 2,700. And I was like jumping around my apartment in college. I was so pumped. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So, you know, JJ, I know this was, um, you know, this 2012 era. I know it was maybe a little bit after you got out, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, APS was, uh, I, I was Dr. Frankenstein on, on that one. Um, I, I taught most of those guys how to do it and, uh, they created APS. Uh, wow. That's, that's, my, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. One of my old, one of my best friends and old business partners was very instrumental in APS. Wow. Um, and not a lot of people know about it because those guys came out and, you know, they, I taught them well, they pulled about four to $6 billion out of the market and then disappeared into the wind. Wow. Um, and were never, ever seen or heard from again. And uh, were, were a few of those guys uh, like busted? I thought I might, might have heard that a few years there ago. There was one sacrificial lamb out of Montreal. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was the fall guy. And uh, wow. I'd never even heard of this kid. But uh, the, the money all came out of Asia to fund it. And uh, it, was, it was a big operation. It was a big operation. And uh, unfortunately, I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't participate. Uh, I had just had a quintuple bypass in 2012. And uh, so I had had this massive heart attack and stuff like that. So, but those guys definitely, uh, they, they did about, I don't know, I think they did about 20 deals and they pulled about six to $8 billion out of liquidity out of, out of pink sheet stocks, pink sheet, which is quite commendable. Um, you know, That's and uh, yeah, they were doing, you know, they were doing 20, 30, $50 million days, you know, where they'd be selling $50 million worth of stock a day for like a week and then you know on to the next deal and, well, and the, uh, the way those worked was like they they basically had the shares from like a thousandth of a penny or less right yeah yeah well i taught them you 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 know you you structure that stuff all the paper was uh they had a they had a, an attorney out of san diego and uh, god bless him wherever the hell he is now uh most of these guys are you know probably in outer mongolia or some of them are hiding in plain view i know that but uh they, they all did uh, out of that group, you know, they all made 200, three, $400 million each. And, um, you know, they, yeah, they pulled, they, they pulled a rabbit out of the hat on that. I taught them a lot of dirty tricks and, uh, they used them very successfully, uh, very, pro <laughs> you know, a little later I kind of went, Oh my God, what did I do teaching these guys this stuff? But, uh, at the time it was beautiful seeing that, you know, and it's nice to see, you know, 50, a hundred million dollars in dollar volume out of a pink sheet stock, you know, yeah. because when I look at a market, I don't look at, you know, I, I was never a retail trader until after my heart attack. So I look and I see, okay, if it traded a hundred million dollars worth of paper, 
um, how much of that would I be liquidating? I got to be at least 30%. So for my clients, I got to have 30 million in the accounts after that day. Otherwise I'm fired minimum, Wow. right? If it trades a hundred million, I've got to be liquid 30, hmm. right? Because we're the seller, right? We're Larry the liquidator, hmm. right? So yeah, that was, yeah, I still, yeah, you're the first person to actually mention those guys in, a, in, in about five or six years. I haven't, you know, it, uh, it's definitely a trip down memory lane. I remember oh, watching yeah, those well, yeah, deals. They, they were, they were so unique, like in, yeah. in terms of what they could do with those techers. It was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Forget. And, uh, yeah. And my, one of my best friends was their lead market maker out of Denver, Colorado. And, uh, you know, you used to see Wilson Davis all over those deals, WDCO on your level oh, two. Yeah. I remember that. Uh, <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah, and, okay. uh, he was affectionately yeah, known in the industry as the bitch. And he was <laughs> the one where all the uh, order flow went through. And all of a sudden, you know, you'd see the market come off, come off, and everyone would start shorting. And all of a sudden, there'd be a million share bid, you know, coming out of Salt Lake City. And, uh, you know, everyone would just, and that was him, you know, because the, we'd sell the market down and then buy it all back up and rail it back up. And it was, yeah, that was, I, I, I saw those guys and it was... It was a sight to behold. And it's amazing that they got away with it. Right. Um, <laughs> that's what, yeah, that, that really is. Know, yeah. That, that is because out, out of all those players, you know, the, the, the three letter guys got everybody else except that crew. And uh, that was a good crew. It's probably, you won't see a crew like that after a while, you know, especially at those lower tier markets. They said the three letter boys. <laughs> Uh, Tim, so Tim, while, while we're on this topic, um, I'm curious to, you know, the, the evolution to like, not only your trading, but to maybe how these, maybe some of these pump and dumps have behaved over time. Uh, I'm someone myself who, who likes shorting, uh, maybe not some of like the most wild ones, but I, you know, some of these I suspect are, you know, being manipulated a little bit. Um, yeah, maybe just talk to like the evolution of that. Is this still a, um, a strategy of yours that you implement? Uh, so, I mean, I haven't, I haven't traded an OTC in a couple of years now, at least, um, no volume. but it, uh, yeah, it was, you know, after, after a lot of those big pumpers, you know, just went offline and stopped doing their thing, it, it kind of became a little less obvious, I'd say, like, at least like to inexperienced traders, I think, like less obvious that what they were trading was garbage. Um, because I remember the next big thing was a lot of marijuana stocks going nuts in like 2014 <laughs> and i know there were a lot of true believers on the marijuana stocks but it was exact same patterns you know just huge jam it up big volume and then it would just fall apart 50 percent plus in one day um and it, it was probably about six months into being a full-time trader where i really did get into more uh short selling so you know that, that's back in 2012 again mm -hmm. um but it, it was, I was pretty conservative, I want to say, with my, with my shorting. I wasn't really trying to step in front of it or catch a top. It was, it was really like wait for the stock to show some true weakness, be red, and then just go after it. And, um, you really could read the level two on those OTCs and kind of see the turning action on the level two. So I would usually just cover into the easy turning action, no questions asked, and not really worry about the fact that, you know, it's a true zero and it's going to go lower in the next few weeks. I just kind of wanted to take an easy piece and be done. Mm -hmm. Smart. Smart, definitely smart, and that—that's how, you know, covering into weakness is is a great way to book profits, you know, especially on those things, right? Because mm -hmm. you never know when they're going to shut off supply, right? Right. Yeah. And then back then, consistency and growth was really my mindset. So it was so much more important to me to just get out and grow the account versus be perfect and catch the bottom. Um, you know, sure. if, if I had waited for it to get back down to zero, you know. <laughs> Sure. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so Tim, as you were, you know, focusing on account growth, your account was growing. Um, I'm sure your strategies shifted a little bit. Uh, maybe the stocks you were trading, do you, you want to just speak to that a little bit, how you uh, grew as a trader? Yeah, it definitely ha it had to shift. Um, you know, like I, I did see that like those blatant promotions were drying up. So I was starting to prepare for it a little bit where I was, I was starting to dabble a little bit with listed stocks, track them a little bit. Excel sheets and just try to get a feel for how they tend to move. You know, like basically my first question was, okay, you have a big runner that's a listed stock, you know, maybe closes 20% or more up on the day. Just on average, how do those perform the next day? That was kind of the first thing I was trying to track and answer. And then, um, you know, once 
the marijuana stocks died down. I mean, th those, I feel like those ended in a series of halts. Right? It's like, <laughs> oh, this company, this company that was a mining company two weeks ago now says they're in marijuana. <laughs> Thank you, so, Vancouver. <laughs> yeah, like three or four of those got halted in a row. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oops, the sea liquidity was just gone. And there was nothing moving anymore. And it really wasn't tradable. So it, it basically just forced me to say, okay, I'm, I'm on listed stocks now. And let's, uh, Let's try to get some more practical um, experience here. And I, I just, I, I want to say I started trading a little bit smaller, but I, I was pretty quickly growing a lot of size on listed stocks. And, uh, you know, I, I did run into my issues with that. Mm -hmm. Would you, um, did you have any initial struggles with the, the, the transition um, at first? At first, I think, so the way it kind of progressed was that I, I, I would go into those day twos with a short buy because that's what my data was looking like. It was like, okay, they run for a day and then a lot of them collapse. And with that short bias, it, it was hard because things were so much choppier and the level two was not nearly as useful to me as it had been with uh, OTCs. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was getting faked out a lot. And I let that turn into, I'm going to use a really wide stop and I'm just going to not really cut my losers. And I got away with that for a really long time where I would, I would go on these 50K drawdowns. They Oof. were really uncomfortable for me. And my, my worst was probably 150K or so. And then almost every time I was getting up for break even or better, um, I, I had almost never gotten burned by it. And it really ingrained a terrible habit because, because then you, know, you get to that emotional component too, where you know, it, it's, you're, you're in one of those big drawdowns and it's showing no signs of stopping. And you're looking at that unrealized loss number saying like, well, there's no way I can cut now. And so it, it all kind of led up to a huge uh, $290,000 loss, I want to say, on uh, LAKE. Oh, um, Lake. Yeah, Lake, yeah. I, I love that stock. Well, oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, uh, I wish I got my revenge on it back during all the COVID stuff a couple of years ago, but I don't think I ever wound up touching it too much. I was more involved with uh, APT. Okay. But uh, yeah, Lake, Lake tagged me real bad. And it was probably about a quarter of my gains on the year at that point. So it was, it was, you know, definitely recoverable and it, it didn't like take me out of the game or anything like that, but it was emotionally devastating. And it kind of sent me into this mental tailspin where I tried for like two weeks to trade. Like I, I was trading this massive size for two weeks after that, like really wild and out of control. Like I've got to make the loss back. And yeah. then I finally took about a week off and just reset mentally and emotionally. And I was, I was well behaved for another three months or so until I took another six year loss. <laughs> Very oh. similar style. Um, was and this it happened to me three or four times where it was just, I, I'd go through a few months of good trading. And was it DGLY? On one. And yeah, it was just that I had ingrained that too, way too deeply. Um, I'd gotten away with it for too long. So I finally had this kind of emotional breaking point where it was like, I'm not going to last as a trader if this keeps happening to me. So I, I basically punished myself and made myself size down to about a tenth of what I had been trading started tracking my losses in a loss journal, holding myself accountable daily, you know, logging every mistake I made, saying, like, did I get stubborn? Did I um, play it too large? Uh, I can't remember what my other ones really, did I add to a loser outside of my risk? That was a big one. because That was a big part of what was making my losses spiral. Mm -hmm. um, so I just went on this period of accountability where at the end of the month, I would look at my mistake tally. And if it was you know, pretty low, I would let myself size up a little bit the next month again. And if I had had a bad discipline month, I had to keep it the same. Nice. And I, I took about nine or 10 months doing this, I want to say, before I finally was back to about my normal size. And I was much more in control of my risk, which that stubborn holding. So uh, then that, that kind of set the stage for some pretty explosive account growth from there. Oh, yeah, nice. well, I, go ahead, Jake. Sorry, I, I was just wondering that that second hit you took was that DGLY? Uh, no, that wasn't DGLY. That was um, PBMD. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I remember that one. I think it was, I like, it was like a buck to six bucks or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, because Lake and DGLY ran at the same time, right? Wow. And DGLY was when Carl Icahn, Icahn went and bought a whole position in it. And just sucked all the paper out of DTC, and it caused a massive short squeeze. I remember a lot of traders got oh, stuck yeah. on that one. Yeah, um, yeah but, I mean the right the the first month I was doing my you know accountability thing and tracking my losses and waist size down was uh, KBIO. 
the uh, oh, okay. dollars to twenty four dollars after hours or whatever it was, and touched what to touch fifty eventually, I think. Um, yeah. But that was uh, I, I was really really glad that I it was um, I kind of learned my lesson by then because that one could have been <laughs> devastating. Oh yeah, no kidding. Yeah, those some of those squeezes were uh, were really really quite well done. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, just so you know, I wasn't involved in any of those two. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was nowhere near the scene of the crime on that. So yeah, it was you know it, it was it was surprising to me that it happened on a larger scale on listed stocks. Like I, I knew I knew you oh. got listed stocks that run, but it took it took a little while for me to realize like wow, the exact same shit is happening here just on a bigger oh scale. yeah yeah i've i've been contracted to to orchestrate short squeezes and even up to like nasdaq um nasdaq full-blown nasdaq um you know I had to keep a stock over 30 bucks for three months wow and yeah so i held it at 90 rsi for three months by, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah so because they were working that's on that's his finance. favorite one tim he mentions this one all the time he, that he, was oh, yeah. fun that that took some effort i i was like that that was that was a tiring three months, man. That was like keeping a lot of plates up in the air. You you were keeping it over thirty, you said. Yeah. And then it did eventually like have some big squeeze up to like sixty or ninety or something. No, no, no. The guy the guy running the deal uh, was a uh, at the time a fairly well known arms dealer, and uh, <laughs> ended up uh, the whole thing fell apart like a cheap suit, and it took down two clearing firms. But wow. uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. It was his farewell deal. He pulled a lot of money out of it. Uh, man, like side. before the show, I was saying to you that like I'm totally ignorant to your side of the world, and it's, it's even worse than I thought. Man, like I had, <laughs> I had no idea. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you put four billion dollars on a table, nothing's random. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, you know, we've talked about this before, JJ, like offline and stuff. Like I, I think some of these um, China stocks, um, more or less, at times. Uh, you know, can be behave, you know, behave interestingly, but we'll, we'll save that for another. We'll save that for exactly. Another. Um, yeah. You mean HKD wasn't natural price action? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, that was just, HKD. that just randomly occurred, naturally occurring, like moss growing on a stone. Well, it's just incredible you know? that they don't, they don't get audited, you know, that they can, <sighs> but we'll, we'll save that. We don't have to jump into that now, unless we, unless you guys want to. No, they just let it happen. And then they try and catch people afterwards. Like, but during the actual assault, on on the u.s investor it's you know nothing is said you yeah. know but hey i don't make the rules yeah yeah uh tim i i want to i want to circle back to uh you talking about the you know the the big loss you were taking um i thought it was interesting because I, I can totally relate with this right like getting away with a bad habit for a while and it and not burning you um I, I just think, you know, for the listeners, I mean, if that's such an important part, like, cause you could know, like, like Tim, I'm, you probably knew like while you were, you know, being loose with your stock, you knew you probably shouldn't be doing this. Right. Like. I, I definitely knew I was taking a risk, but I think I was a little ignorant to like how big of a risk I was taking. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like th- there was definitely a part of me that felt kind of smart where it was like, Oh, Hey, I didn't panic. And it turned out. Okay. Like, yeah. Me. Um, but, you know, back then we hadn't really seen too much where it's like, you know, like we see now where it's like a dollar to a hundred dollars or, you know, these ridiculous, you know, like the, like the black swan events have gotten more and more insane as the years have gone by. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, like, I, I think that I still kind of had the, a little bit of the like, oh, well, I can't go higher than like, you know, whatever number in my head was at the time. And I, I've definitely extinguished that line of thinking, like it, it can always go higher. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I let, you know, you know, JJ, uh, Walter Deemer, um, we, we've had him on the podcast, o- old school analyst, 50 plus years. He always, it, that always ingrained to me. He said, stocks can run further than you think. Like, just always like keep that in your mind. Like it's never further enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and same to the downside um, as well. I think that's just a great, it's great like tidbit to always keep in mind. Um, you know, t- Tim too, with a bit to, um, you know, chasing losses. I, I think, you know, e- even like in poker, I take it back to me playing poker, man. Like if I took a big loss or a week of losses, something of that nature, um, you know, you want to, you want to get it back. Right. I mean, it, but it's only like natural. Um, when do you think you kind of like got over that hump or like, what was it for you that like instilled in you? Like, Hey, like, no, nah, I just got to take this one day at a time. I got to be disciplined. You know, what was it for you? 
Um, I mean, really, I, I think after every really large loss that tilted me emotionally, I, I just learned I had to take time off. I, I had to give myself a few days at least. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was really no other answer I ever came up with because it, it did affect me and it was going to keep affecting me unless I just stepped back and calmed down. So, um, so really that, that just kind of became my solution, like just, just back off. Like, and I, I will say like, you know, if it was a situation where I got squeezed big, covered up, and then the stock was still holding up and still possibly set up for like that first red day or big gap down or something, mm -hmm. I, I would at least show up for that day. And, and then once the stock was out of play, then I'd step back. So, so that's kind of what it evolved to, I guess, where it was like, okay, I'm still gonna try to catch the backside of this move. I will try to keep myself under control while I'm doing that. And then, and then I'll give myself a little break. Um, Cause one thing I found too, was that um, yeah, after a couple times of chasing losses with really large size, I kind of went, in the complete opposite direction where I'd take a large loss and then go into that perfect red day and be scared and get like no size behind the trade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, you know, it was like, okay, I can make a little bit back here, but it's, um, you know, it's not going to make up for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tim, uh, what advice um, would you give to traders who are, you know, let, let's say they're doing well, they're, they're growing their account. Uh, what would you give to them like on sizing up? on their trades um, and, you know, maybe some of the, the pitfalls that can happen uh, or, you know, just struggles you encounter. Yeah. So for me, when I, when I would take steps up in size, um, like I, I always, well, at least after I did my whole uh, fix my bad risk mentality and get my discipline under control, I always went into a trade with a risk first mentality. So the way I would kind of measure my size was if I'm wrong and the stock hits my stop point, how much money I'm going to lose. And so I, I would know exactly what that number was going to be. And so sizing up would be, let's make that number bigger. So it, it wasn't so much like a certain percent of the account on the line or a certain dollar amount per trade. It was just how much will I lose if I'm wrong? So for example, I might step from like a 10K max loss to a 12K max loss. Um, and, and I would definitely try to be kind of aware of how I was feeling about it. Um, like when, when I was doing that rebuilding process, there, there were some points where I, I think I was at like $2,000 a trade at one point, I tried to step up to 3000. And for the first week, my discipline was shit. And I was like, why, why am I struggling all of a sudden? And it was because all of a sudden, like that $3,000 loss felt uncomfortable to me because I was used to that last month of $2,000 losses. So I, I forced myself to step back a little bit and, you know, ease my way back into it, you know, maybe go 2,500 and then 3000. Um, it, it's really just for me trying to stay very self-aware and very honest with myself about where, like, where am I making mistakes and why am I making mistakes and uh, just change whatever I have to change to make that happen. Yeah. Have you, um, if you've had any like moments of doubt throughout your career, um, I think you've maybe alluded a little bit to it. Um, you know, and if so, like, how, how did you deal with those, those, um, you know, these bouts of maybe like, Hey, can I make it? Can I not, can I size up, you know, things of that nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, when I blew up my first 1500, it was funny. Cause I really didn't have any doubt there. It was, it was still like, wow, I still think I have all these ideas and all these things I can try. And I think I know exactly what I did wrong. The real doubt moment was after that third six figure loss. Uh, that one was on CANF where it was just like, I'm, I'm in, I'm not in control of myself. Like, how does oh, this keep happening? That and what's that? Yeah, I remember that deal. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that one, that one, I mean, it was a little bit better. That was only like 105,000 or so, but still. It, uh, yeah, well, you know, 100 grand here, 100 grand there, it adds up, yeah. you know? But that, yeah, that was my, that was my real doubt myself. Moment. Like, even yeah. though I was still very green on the year, even though I still had had a great career up to that point, it was just kind of recognizing that moment. Like, I, I felt really stuck because I did not know how to fix my stubbornness. I just couldn't. I, I just couldn't figure out how to get myself under control. Um, so even though it sucked to size down for a while, that long process of rebuilding discipline really paid off for me and was beneficial. Um, and I guess, you know, even, even now, like I, I've been, you know, I've been fairly out of the game for a couple of years now. Um, I've been very family focused. I have two young kids at home and, uh, I, I will only pop into trade here and there and use this just like low float longs in my E-Trade account. 
Um, and and I, I've had success overall with that, but it's, it's nothing like it used to be. And I'm starting to like, like there have been times where I've been like, oh, it'd be nice to short this stock. And I just don't feel comfortable like I used to just, you know, cause I haven't been in front of it every day. I haven't been, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the muscle memory is wearing off, I guess. Um, so th there's a little bit of uh, self doubt there. You know, if I dive back into it hard, like I think I need to be careful with size for a little while and just get a little familiar. Cause I think things are definitely moving differently than they used to. Um, like my, my outside of market hours project recently has been automation. Um, I'm working with a friend I met down in Puerto Rico. He does all the coding. I try to provide the logic. And the idea was just to automate some strategies that will fully, you know, go through the whole process. They'll, they'll ping the locate routes and all the brokers, get the locate, short the stock if it has a certain amount of crack off of the highs. Um, and, you know, we, we, have a, we have numerous algos up and running, um, but that has been far more of a struggle than I expected it to be. And you know, I, I get I get a little bit of like an imposter syndrome type feeling from that, you know, where it's like, why isn't this easy? This should be easy for me. Well, I, I think a lot of times like having uh, I I've done a little bit work with other people, not and I'm not like really that bit much of a technical guy, but it's it's a lot harder sometimes, I guess, to like or harder than I think people imagine, at least that I thought to like put a strategy into like code and have a, a computer executed and like you don't have that discretionary element you can to like. Mm -hmm to move it a little bit? Have you encountered that a little bit, Tim, you think? Oh, I think that's by far like what's holding us back is, um, you know, like I, I, by by far, exits have always been the weakest part of my trading. Um, I, I've always had a hard time with figuring out when to get out. Mm -hmm. And usually if it's like, if I'm short something, usually I'm just kind of like randomly covering into weakness, maybe taking off half here, half there. But it's, you know, I'm getting out in the panics. I'm getting out usually decently close to lows, at least of that round of panic. And I've had a lot of trouble getting that into code and figuring out how to de define like how low is low enough. Um, because like, you know, you, if you try to use even advanced like technical indicators, like RSIs seem to be like all over the place. You, you might have one morning panic where the RSI is like 15 and another one where it's like 50. And oh, yeah. uh, it's, it, yeah, so it's, that's kind of what I'm exploring right now is trying to figure out is there something I'm missing on technical indicator side because that's never been a huge part of my trading in the past um but yeah just trying to better improve my exits uh that oh, that's be cool well give me a dm when you have a chance i'll show you uh how structure might be able to help you there with your exits oh i'd love to thank you yeah, yeah. it kind of helps to know where the lower stops are and if you can't take the lower stops then you don't have the supply to break them mm -hmm. yeah so so tim um you know lately like, like you mentioned you're a bit more like part-time now do you um do you get like an itch to you know to come back do you miss the game a little bit where, where are you at with that I, i'm very conflicted to be honest um they're like I, i'm good friends with uh, ducks and it's I, I get the itch when i see ducks doing really well because i'm like man like that that kid is killing it and i want to be like right there with him killing it um but at the same time, like you can't really put a price on, like, you know, be, on being more involved in your kids' lives. And sure. uh, I, I have been able to pop in during times where the market is really crazy, like when all, when all oil stuff was going on back in March. Um, like I, in the span of a couple of weeks, I made about a million dollars on loss, which was like, is like, okay, like I just popped in very briefly and did that. Like, like who, who could want anything more, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, like, I also reckon, like, I, I question if I'll come back to it full time because I've had periods in my career where I was full time and I was killing it. And it hasn't really been all that fulfilling or made me all that happy. Like, you know, I, I'm down in Puerto Rico. I'm like glued to my screen all day and like, yeah, I made some money. But like at this point, the money doesn't change my life at all. And it's like, well, I didn't go to the pool today. I didn't go to the beach today. I just sat inside in front of my screen all day. <laughs> um, so that that's kind of a big draw of like the automation side of things too for me. It's like I'd love to get that to a place where I'm like satisfied with it uh, and feel like it does a good job um, because that gives me a lot more freedom away from the screen and you know and I'm still at least in some way involved in the market. Yeah, yeah, that's like a a best of both worlds type type of uh, solution there. Yeah, it's, it's it's funny like like getting to a point and then realizing like man like you know, like you're saying, you're in Puerto Rico, making a lot of money, but still like, 
there's still like something missing almost, right? Like not, not, not to take this on a spiritual path, but like these are things I think <laughs> about though as well though, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I think I think the way I can best define it is um, it, it stopped being about the money a long time ago um, because your life, at least in my opinion, my life is not going to be much different whether I have, you know, $15 million in the bank account or $30 million in the bank account. Um, but, you know, seeing a lot of these other guys excel who I kind of you know, came up with and you know, traded alongside with, like there's a little bit of a feeling of like, oh, I haven't met my potential because I see what they're able to do. And I feel like, you know, I should be able to do that too. But at the same time, there's an element of conscious choice to it, where it's like, I have removed myself from the situation. So I, I think, yeah, I, if that makes sense, that's kind of where I come from mentally. Yeah, I think it, it absolutely makes sense. It's a question of, you know, um, yeah, like, like, like you said, it might not change your life, but there's, there's a thing too, to fulfilling your potential um, and, and owing that to yourself. So, you know, obviously these things are very nuanced. It's very conflicting. It's different for each oh, individual yeah. um, as well. But, and the good thing is you're young, right? So you could maybe, you know, take five, 10 years off and then you have the capital reserves to do whatever the heck you want. Come back. You know, you can do this until you're 70, 80. It doesn't really matter. So that, that is true. Yeah. The market's still got lots of time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, kid, the kids will be off to school too soon, Tim. It'll definitely free up some time. Uh, oh, yeah. At least, you know, it's, you know, my son's at school. He has a different activity. So I got a little more, you know, wiggle room. So, you know, maybe, maybe that would be the time. Um, all right. Got some general trading, I guess, uh, questions for you, Tim. Uh, what, what do you think is a concept that most traders don't understand? Um probably risk management honestly um because i i see so many people with the cut losses quickly mentality and i i mean that's a good mentality in some degree but like it turns into these random like stop outs where it's like oh i'm down a little bit i'm gonna get out or or they go in with these like preconceived percent ideas where it's like if i'm down one percent i'll cut the trade and it's like well great but like you know you, you just cut this long and support's still holding perfectly just because, you know, it dipped a little bit below your entry. Um, so I, I've, I've seen, that, that's an issue I've just never seen go away. People don't know how to, you know, read a chart or play off of the chart. And I will say that it seems like in the last couple of years, uh, we have started to see some of those key chart points faked out a lot more. Um, I think mm-hmm. some of JJ's friends might be uh, playing more <laughs> games. <laughs> well, now they have algos and, and you know, AI and, you know, my God, you know, market making and, and running deals now is so much easier. You know, it's like having that Porsche with the, you know, the uh, seven speed transmission where you just click and it, it's yeah. amazing. You can, you know, run 300 trades in, in the time that it takes a, you know, a human trader, you know, to do yeah. maybe 20. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the automation and I find that beautiful because it makes the markets more precise. I mean, we trade futures. And I can tell you exactly where the market's going to go and where it's going to stop based on where the stops are. And, um, you know, knowing where the stops are, you know, really helps our guys with risk management. Oh, because, sure. Yeah, I'd imagine. You know, because if you're long and the market can't take out the lower stops, then your thesis for the trade is still valid. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. you might have to wait a little while depending on the order flow. But, you know, so that that really helps. But it's, it's really interesting because I remember reading about you. Uh, because, you know, I, I had read about you and, and I remember because, uh, you know, one of your friends had put out this video where he was in a church confessional and he was talking about all these, all these deals, you know, and, you know, I was talking about Vancouver and that's where I did all my business, right? So all these deals wow. were at, at the epicenter of Vancouver pretty much. So it was, yeah, I remember, I remember seeing you come into the business and, and I uh, always wondered how well you did. And, and that's good to see that you've done really well. It's really nice to see. Yeah, I, I survived. <laughs> I, I did. Good. Um, yeah. You know, what? One, one question I have for you, if you don't mind. Um, so, no like, yeah, you, guys, you guys can see the stops, which I, I think a lot of us have already always known. But I've always been curious how much information you have on, you know, how, how many people are short something. Uh, well, that's easy to see because and you, you don't even need to be a market maker to figure that out. We use this thing called market profile, but you can apply it to candles. It's, it's, it, it's market structure. Where you see people short are where the bids will be. It's just completely amazing. Come drop by our room sometime and uh, 
will show you and you'll be able to see in equities. Now, Ray doesn't use it for equities, but you can use it for equities. But, okay. you know, Ray will understand the basics of market mechanics and, you know, where the shorts are, you know, where they get taken, where the stops, upper stops get taken. When you come back down to that area, there are going to be bids there because the shorts are going to be trying to cover there. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, Ray, Ray was like one of the best students I ever had because he came into it already with risk management for poker. So that was like, he was like 70% ahead of everybody else that way. Oh yeah. 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 I definitely credit poker to, um, easing the learning curve. I wouldn't say totally, but you know, just the, just the mental aspects, which are probably maybe arguably more important. Um, mm -hmm. cause anyone can learn like the technical stuff, but, um, Tim, what you, what you said, and, and I think I, I read that, well, you know, when I was preparing for the podcast, I, I think I read this from you and I, and I really like this, what you're saying in regards to the stops, um, is, or, or, cut, or cutting losses, uh, not, not quickly, but cutting losses intelligently. And I've, I've never heard it phrased like that. And I think that's, um, it's probably a better way to, 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 to phrase it and, and to, to go about your stop. So I, I really like that. Um, all right. Thoughts on aggression and its role in trading. Um, boy, I mean, I, I, I think you gotta have it to a certain degree for sure. Um, I, I know there are a lot of traders who are a lot more aggressive than me. Um, like, so going back to my story about the $2,700 AMWI win, um, you know, I basically doubled my account in six minutes. And my reaction to that wasn't let's double it again. My reaction was I've got to protect these gains. So I didn't, I didn't start throwing the money around like madman. I tried to just stick to what was working and stick to what I was doing. And, you know, yeah, I was going to go big on the next, you know, big pump and dump and that I could try to get in quickly and early, but basically I wasn't going to like start throwing money away on setups. I wasn't familiar with just because I had it all of a sudden. Um, one, one thing that I think some traders do better than me is really sizing up the A plus setups. Um, you know, when back when I was kind of finishing up my full time trading um, a couple of years ago in the middle of all the craziness in 2020, I, uh, I was probably about 10K, 15K risk per trade. And there, there would be, you know, a setup on some day where I'd say, okay, this looks like an A plus short to me. And I'd size in my initial risk, double that. But I rarely went more than that. I, I so, and I know some guys who they will they will go from you know 50k risk to like you know a million risk. Like they'll they'll really go nuts <laughs> on the ones that they think they got the big edge. Um, so sometimes I feel like that's insane, and sometimes I feel like I might be kind of missing something here and missing a little bit of aggression and ability to you know really go after it like they do. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I asked him cause it's kind of a personal question. Cause I, you know, maybe one of the things that didn't suit me so well from coming from poker is like aggressive poker wins. Like you, you, you have to play aggressive. And I still think to a degree with trading as well, right? Like you have to be aggressive, but like you also have to be a little bit more defensive in trading, I think as well. And just towing that line, I think can be tricky at times. At least it is uh, for myself. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't mind taking a stab at something that's like a little bit outside of my playbook. Like if, if, if I think I see something setting up and it's like, okay, it's not quite there yet, but it seems like a really advantageous entry, you know, I'll go for it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mind being aggressive in that sense, you know, but then I've got to keep it under control to the point where I'm not going to take a double or triple loss on this, right. you know, subpar setup. Like I've got to keep my size under control. So, so I, I'm cool. I'm cool with, you know, stepping a little outside of the playbook, but size, and risk, it always has to be the first thought. Size and risk have to be first. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's what I've been working on is, is, you know, cause I'm going to be aggressive, but sizing appropriately or sizing to where I'm like, comfortable. I don't want to say com like so comfortable, but you know, I'm not sitting there fucking just glued to the screen, just nervous as hell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tim, so I'm just miscellaneous questions. Then uh, we'll, we'll get you going here, man. You, you've made a lot of uh, appearances on major, television networks uh throughout the years uh, i'm just i'm just uh curious to some of your experiences on, on those if any anything notable came from those um you know I, I don't feel like i walked away from any of those with any like great stories i you know i was i was a kid back then i was uh what have I been 23 or something like I, it was a long time ago um 
yeah, I think I think I was just kind of like wide eyed and a little overwhelmed by it all, to be honest. Um, yeah. Like the uh, the Cavuto one I did was like I didn't even go anywhere for that. It was like a little like television office in Columbus, and like they basically just like satellited me in. Hmm. Um, the the Fox and Friends was uh, actually like went out to New York, and uh, that was the first time in New York City, and that that was that was cool to uh, kind of be out there and see Times Square and all that, but. Yeah, it just, it just, like, it all felt like it just flew by and happened so fast. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I wish I wish I had some interesting story for you, but it all just kind of went off without a hitch. And, uh, no interesting 3 a.m. New York stories? Oh, not really. We, uh, you <laughs> know, I, I, was, I, was with, I was with Tim Sykes, and he tried to bring a Balthazar into uh, Jean George and kind of got reprimanded for that a bit. That was, uh, <laughs> that was probably the funniest thing that happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we we were talking a little bit offline, Tim. Um, that you tried giving poker a go. Uh, was that before oh, yeah. before trading? Maybe to just just to get, yeah, just a little curious about your poker, your early poker days. Yeah, that was that was well before trading. Um, that you know, I was in high school and it was like Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker, and everyone was like, "Oh, anybody can do it." We've had him and on the podcast, by the way, Moneymaker. Have you really? Oh, I got to watch. Oh yeah, that. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Man, but yeah, so like all, me and all my friends immediately got way into poker and you know, lots of poker games at our houses, but it was probably about like junior year of high school or senior year of high school where I discovered this, there was this um, charity poker that like traveled around the Chicago area. Oh, yeah. And basically because it was charity poker, you only had to be 18 to play. You didn't have to be like 21 like you do to get into a casino. So I started going to these charity poker games, which, you know, it's typically $100, $200 buy-ins, which time was a lot of money for me and it was just one of those things where I, I don't think I was ever as good at it as I thought I was um and I, I I was a little bit because it was a lot of money to me at the time I was a little bit out of my element emotionally like where I would be like way too nervous I probably had a shitload of tells mm -hmm. um but it was yeah it was like I found initial success with it I felt like I was a good poker player for a while I made a couple thousand bucks one summer and then just kind of slowly you know, bullet it all away and then got into sports betting from there and NFL betting specifically and very similar story where for a few years I was really good at it. I had all these Excel systems to like mathematically predict winners and I was hitting at a pretty good rate. And then through a combination of, I think, just bad money management and being, you know, in college and partying all the time, I kind of started paying less attention to it and threw away a lot of my sports betting games. And I was just like, you know, this gambling thing is not really working out. Like, and that, that's also part of what led me into trading. There still was like a little bit of that like high adrenaline thing going. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I wonder if any of those like early experiences maybe um, helped you a little bit with trading, maybe. Um, oh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me at all, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, do you do any of these activities at all? I'm, uh, you know, the past two years especially, I've been real into player props for football uh um, betting is, is there anything do you, do you do any betting or poker anymore or just i i haven't i i haven't really had time to keep up with like it like i, I don't think i do football betting again unless i tried to like do a whole spreadsheet system again yeah um and that just was a little too much work and i don't have time for that right now and then poker uh, same thing i just haven't had a lot of time to play um it, it is something i could see myself getting into again though in the future when i have more time like that that is definitely a uh fun channel like I, I'll, I'll be a poker player i don't think i'll ever be like a golfer i i don't have the patience for golf so <laughs> yeah yeah and they're they're, they're, they're similar in, in a lot of respects you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot you're gonna you know but like you said poker can be a lot quicker you know you do it as long as you want um yeah. uh tim um not sure if you if you're a reader at all but i usually like asking guests for uh book recommendations or a good book they've read recently um, I have not read much recently. Um, like my, my go-to book recommendation is uh, Daily Trading Coach by um, Brett Steenbarger um, yep. because that is one of the, like that's what I was reading back when I went through my whole risk management thing. Mm -hmm. and it's all about like, you know, mastering, basically mastering yourself and your emotions and working on eliminating those bad decisions as a trader. So um, that, that book was a huge help to, you know, it's basically where I got my whole lost journal idea from. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that'd be my go-to for anyone who's struggling with awesome. similar kinds of things. Awesome. Awesome. Another guy we've had on the podcast um, a while back now, JJ, I think, but yeah, it's awesome. been a while since we, we need to have him back on. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's great. Um, 
All right, Tim. Uh, I know I know you spend a lot of time with the kids, but what uh, other than that, what what else are you uh, doing to occupy your time? Any uh, hobbies, activities? Um, yeah, it's really been a lot of um, outside of market hour algo recently. You know, trying to like solidify logic to that stuff. So it'll typically be like the kids go to bed, and you know, I'll, I'll watch a couple of shows with my wife, and then uh, get to work and do some do a few hours of work every night. Um, I, you know, I, I'm gonna get back into like a basketball league or something really soon. Um, nice. Bowl, I, I, I like bowling. I want to get into a bowling league again too. So, you know, kind of stepping back into some of these uh, more active things again is on my radar. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what, what shows are you and your wife, uh, currently watching? Oh, uh, we're watching, we're watching these, uh, like funny old, like mysteries right now, like Columbo or uh, Faro or stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I tend to watch, you know, a little more of like the Game of Thrones type stuff, like after she goes to bed, um, you know, the things that are maybe a little more violent, you know, um, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, you know, that whole world, I enjoy that stuff. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, Succession, I don't know, like I, I just, I kind of, I have a handful that I try to keep up on. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I've been, I watched the, um, I've been watching the new Game of Thrones uh, recently, I've been, I've been enjoying that. Yeah, yeah, pretty good job with that one so far. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Um, Tim, if you were, uh, if you had to choose a last meal, what would it be? Um, I'm an ice cream nut, so I mean, a chocolate milkshake is about all I need, and I'll be, I'll be happy. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if, if we're going with like real meal, um, man, my, I got, I got to go with Italian. I think Italian, uh, a good, um, good chicken parm. That probably is where I'm going. Okay. At least a hey, hey, Gratani. He li- he lived up to his name, JJ. He went to yeah, town. There we go. I was looking. I was looking for it. <laughs> yeah, we were. Wa- I was waiting. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So uh, with that, guys, that's going to conclude today's episode of Confessions of a Market Maker. If you guys enjoyed this episode, could you please rate and review it for us? If you would like to join a supportive and professional professional community of traders, you can join JJ and I at microefutures.com. Uh, Tim. Uh, you can let the listeners know uh, anywhere to find you, anywhere you want to direct them, or any parting thoughts. Um, I mean, I, I I'm on Twitter, but I'm not super active. Uh, Twitter under eighty nine, and uh, otherwise, like I, honestly, main parting thought is like I'm just not active on social, and you got all these idiot scammers out there right now trying to use traders' names and be like, hey, like I'll invest for you and double your money. Like it's not. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna message you out of the blue and ask you for your money to invest. So. Um, that that's my main parting message. I think it's just don't fall for any of those idiots. Don't don't fall for them. Uh, JJ, parting thoughts. Oh, great to have you with us. I've heard so much about you. Finally, nice to meet you. And yeah, look forward to uh, chatting with you again. Really, you know, it's it's nice to see the young guys come in and show people that, you know, this this stuff isn't easy. But it, if you put the discipline and the work in uh, over time. It's, it's nice to see people do well in this business. It's really, really nice. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you again for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate your, your humility, your, your, your um, openness with us. And, and I think just the, uh, the perseverance uh, exactly. you know, to, to can you continue through it um, and the discipline. Uh, that's what I'm gonna take away from it. And I really appreciate it, Tim. Thanks, guys. And so for Tim Rigatani, I'm Paulie Walnuts. He's the grill of House Street. You stop, though, intelligently. <laughs>